This is a CNBC Africa exclusive. I'm Nozi Pombanjo. I'm sitting down with the governor of the Central Bank uh, of Kenya, Governor Patrick Ndoroge. We're obviously at the conversation alongside here, uh, the IFC that's taking place in Nairobi, Kenya. The conversation is looking at how do we deepen and develop uh, local capital markets uh, in Africa. And this is a conversation, of course, that has relevance not only for Kenya, but certainly for the continent broadly. Governor, we appreciate the time that you've made to speak to us. Let's connect the role of the central bank to the big conversation that is happening here, developing, deepening, broadening domestic capital markets. What role does the bank play? Thank you, Nozi. The first thing is Africa capital markets are on the move. I think that is the fundamental uh, realization mm -hmm. that all of us um, have seen, have got to. And uh, in a sense, it's something that uh, all actors need to be uh, aware of, but also involved in, um, according to their respective uh, comparative advantages or mandates. So from the perspective of the central bank, our mandate, um, our principal mandate is financial stability. Yes, there are other things like uh, uh, well, price stability, but also financial stability. Mm -hmm. So those are critical. So when we are expanding or looking at uh, the expansion of the capital markets, mm -hmm. uh, we need to be conscious or concerned about financial stability. So what we do then as a central bank is to ensure that we are coordinating with other actors um, so that that objective is not jeopardized. Right. So what does that mean in particular? It means, for instance, if there are things relating to the uh, transactions themselves, uh, we are all part of the national payment system yeah. and we supervise that, that that is done in an orderly fashion mm. and the risks are w well taken care of. Some of the uh, new uh, products that are coming uh, will probably involve some uh, risk, some sort of stability risk. Mm. And uh, we need to look at, it, at them carefully so as to ensure that those risks are mm. taken care of. A good example of uh, such a concern is really what brought us uh, the global financial crisis, if you remember. Mm. And there were products then, which are the mortgage-backed securities, yeah. that in themselves appeared harmless. But for whatever reason, the risks were not taken care of and uh, they brought about the collapse of uh, the financial sector as mm. we knew it um, then. So it's more that. There's a third element, yeah. which is the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the convening power of the, of the central bank. Mm. So there may be things, concerns, questions that are important yeah. And uh, we need to have various actors around the table to discuss this. And we use our convenient power to yeah. bring them together. Mm. A good example of that is the Green Bond Initiative in Kenya, where we are not the ones as a central bank that will be involved in issuing this Green Bond. Mm. But we've used our convenient power uh, to bring all the actors together mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully we'll get a good outcome mm. uh, because all the actors are now talking around the table um, and, uh, mm. and hopefully then we will end up having a good outcome. Is there anything that's standing out for you from this particular conversation that makes you believe that this focus and this conversation on capital market development is perhaps different from what we've seen in the past and that something that is uh, actionable could actually result out of this? This conference could have taken place anywhere in the world. Could have taken place in uh, Paris, London, mm. Singapore, and you could have had exactly the same concerns, exactly the same issues coming up. Now, it doesn't mean that the capital markets in Singapore or London are at the R level, but I'm talking about the robustness of the conversation mm. and the depth of the discussion. Mm. So from that perspective, this is why um, my starting point was that Africa capital markets are on the mm -hmm. move. Yeah. They are very much, uh, it, it is part of the bigger sort of global um, capital markets structure. I was struck by the 
um, let's say, interest by the audience um, in terms of uh, developing the capital markets in, in Africa. Yeah. Obviously, there's a recognition that uh, maybe uh, Kenya is further ahead in terms yeah. of the infrastructure. But there are other things that need to be done. Um, it wasn't a question of, okay, what else do you need to do and which countries are ahead? There's no this sort of us versus them, yeah. leader versus follower. No, there wasn't any of that. It was more, we all want to do, uh, to do certain things to expand um, the uh, or deepen the capital market in uh, Africa, in Kenya, and precisely because we know the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. That is really what struck me. So those yeah. are the two things that, uh, uh, for me, were fundamental. Yeah. Um, having also 500 people in a room yeah. uh, for then for two days uh, shows that they they are quite focused in this issue, and this issue is important. Perhaps top of mind right now would be uh, the fact that we are hearing comments coming out of the U.S. that um, inflation targets are within reach, that employment targets are within reach, and and of course with that uh, that the interest rate hikes are now imminent. What that would this mean? for Kenya, uh, Kenya's market, the Kenyan uh, currency, the shilling, and the ordinary Kenyan on the street? We should all be very glad that uh, the US um, and indeed more broadly other economies that are linked to it uh, are achieving their targets. Yeah. I think that is very important. Why? I, I think the reason here is that we are in an interconnected world. And uh, their success uh, will actually pull us forward in mm. terms of, uh, well, their success will mean that the global growth will be much higher yeah. and that will be quite beneficial to us. So I think of it more from that perspective, the, that those targets in terms of uh, um, their <laughs> growth, I mm. mean, which is the ultimate target, but yeah. although the intermediate targets are inflation and things mm. like that, are positive <laughs> for them. Now, secondly, it allows them to unwind their um, unconventional monetary policies. Yeah. And this brings them closer to the conventional monetary policies space. Yeah. And this is something that I think all of us uh, want to happen. Uh, the unconventional monetary policy space is an area that, uh, I mean, we are all very uncomfortable. Yeah. And uh, I think the point here is that, yes, it's not just about raising interest rates. It's also about what happens, um, all these other things in, this, in the, in the sidelines, as it were, mm. the uh, reduction in the balance sheets and things like that. All those are part of that mm. narrative. Mm. Now, raising interest rates, yes, it's true. They've signaled that... Uh, in the coming uh, uh, in the coming meetings, yeah. uh, the prospects of uh, raising rates are quite high, and I think we are fine with that. Um, why why would I say that? I think first and foremost is um, the markets will price that, that, and they actually they've already begun pricing it. I mean, last time when uh, no action was taken in mm. terms of adjusting the rates, the markets were just very. They, they just moved on. Yeah. You know. They had priced uh, no change into their computations, into their decisions, and so forth. And this is, in a sense, uh, I would say the success of, uh, of uh, advance, or let's say uh, forward guidance. Yeah. I am now using mm. that term a little mm. more loosely than yes. it was used before. Forward guidance for the markets. So, what does it mean for Kenya specifically? We don't see much, uh, we don't expect this to be in any way uh, sort of uh, uh, well, detrimental to our policy or stance and all that. And actually we don't expect much, uh, mm. much shock from that. Um, as I say, this is well anticipated. Mm. Um, in terms of other things, markets will just continue to move along. Mm. As a matter of fact, today the concerns are the markets appear to be quite benign, you know, they, yeah. and uh, that's, I mean, it seems like everybody mm. has, the markets have, uh, have uh, decided that uh, the, uh, the policy makers and indeed central bankers uh, will deal with whatever risks 
mm. um, that may emerge in the future. Mm. Um, they have the tools to do it and they'll deal with it. So I think things will be much more mm. tranquil. We do not expect to see the emergence of uh, what was the taper tantrum back in 2013. Yeah. No, I think things will be much more moderate. And you have the same level of confidence in terms of the impact on the currency? Absolutely. Um, mm. From our perspective, the shock from the uh, interest rates uh, hike or interest rate adjustment in interest in the U.S. Um, ha would not be that mm. large. Mm. Uh, as I say, most markets have priced it. But also, I mean, judging from what happened in the past, yeah. um, when there was liftoff back in 2015, I believe, um, I. I mean, this is something the currency mm. just contain, maintained as sort of a steady uh, action. Those, the, the markets mm. are very balanced from right. that perspective. That said, so that's not something we expect. But that said, I think it's worth noting that uh, our foreign exchange market is very balanced. Um, also, because we have had a substantial strengthening of the current account. Mm -hmm. It has come down uh, from 9.8% uh, of GDP in 2014, uh, down to 68 in 2015, and in 2016 it was 5.5% of GDP. Mm -hmm. We expect it to be around there, 56 in 2017 maybe. Um, the point I'm making is that the, the, the balanced uh, market yeah has been on the back of a strengthening mm. of the current account. Mm. We also have uh, ample foreign exchange reserves. We have record uh, levels today. Actually, it's the equivalent of 5.5 percent, uh, 5.5 months of imports. Ah. So that's substantial. Mm. And that does not include uh, the precautionary resources, 1.5 billion US dollars uh, that we have uh, rate that we can access um, from the IMF. Yeah. So we took our insurance very early on. Mm. We realized that uh, the world was going to be rather volatile from the external mm. sector, mm. and we took our insurance. Mm. So I think we are much more, we are in a better place. Right. Yeah. So the buffers appear to be certainly in place. Let's reflect a little bit on uh, the private sector and in particular what's been in sharp focus of late and that has been uh, credit, uh, private sector credit growth uh, in the private sector. Um, and seeing this in, you know, reflecting the first quarter and the second quarter of 2016 at 18%, coming down quite sharply. Um, and there's been a lot of um, attempts to align this to the cap on interest rates. So, and maybe let's put that uh, on the table, Governor, and just get a sense of your reflections on this and whether there's been any uh, outcomes of, of any initial investigations or explorations that make that connection or dispute that connection. I think the, that connection is uh, spurious. Um, the decline in uh, credit growth mm. uh, started uh, way before the caps were put in place. The interest rate, the law was, the, the caps on interest rates um, became effective on September 14, 2016. And the decline in growth in the private sector credit uh, started a little before December of uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. So what we, we have seen is a sort of a, a decline from about 22% actually before, yeah. then 18. And uh, the last numbers that we had were um, in uh, February, March, was something like 4.4% and uh, some to, somewhere around 4%. Yes. So mm -hmm. those are the numbers, okay. Um, so let's first take, let's separate them. Let's first talk about credit growth and then we'll also talk about the curves. First, we have to appreciate that uh, this is a much wider phenomenon than just Kenya. Mm -hmm. We've seen uh, sharp declines in private sector credit growth in the region 
And actually, we've seen it outside the region as well. So there's something else going on. So what is going on in Kenya? We've looked at this, this uh, phenomena. And uh, in effect, it's coming from several directions. Um, the, we've looked at the sectors, for instance, that, uh, and the, the critical sectors for th that are explained these are things like uh, trade, mm. uh, personal credit as well, yeah. you know, personal finance. Um, there's also some uh, mining and quarry, quarrying. And, uh, and a lot of this have very specific factors to them. For instance, I'll tell you the thing about uh, credit, I mean about trade, for instance. Um, we, ha we saw a contraction of lending in this sector, which we relate to um, the, let's say, the, um, the problems that some of our retailers, um, the large supermarkets, are yeah. having. This seem to be some of the reasons or rather their their problems led to lack i mean they 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 no, they no longer borrowed from the banks because they were in rather dire um uh, situation and actually unfortunately what they ended up doing is depending more on their suppliers credits yeah so that is really you could say not on the books of the banks that's one factor um we also looked at other factors like uh uh, or rather other sectors like uh, the, uh, the, the uh, mining and querying for that matter. And in mining and querying, actually, there was one large uh, entity that contributed to the decline and so forth. So what we are saying is there are specific factors, mm -hmm. demand side factors sort of related to enterprises the, in, the in, the, uh, in the economy um, mm. And that has led to a sort of a gradual decline to it. Um, before moving on, the question can be asked, what is the impact on growth? Yeah. The point is that there has been a, what I would call a sort of a, a break in the sort of, um, you may call it the relationship between credit growth and uh, GDP. Interestingly, the sectors that, uh, that contribute a lot to growth, for instance, agriculture. Agriculture contributes about 20, 25% mm. to GDP. And uh, it only gets about, uh, it only, only 4% of private sector credit goes to the, uh, to the agricultural sector. So what I mean, what therefore I'm implying with that is that uh, uh, decline in uh, credit growth does not affect agricultural sector mm. GDP that much. Mm. So these are the things that we've looked at. Mm. So we are not as concerned as we would be if there was a linear relationship right. um, just directly from uh, the overall number to GDP. Mm -hmm. So the, it is really when you look at the granular, uh, granular data that you begin to get a sense that there's more going on and indeed um, less concern about that, that mm. link yeah. from credit growth to GDP. Let's, let's continue the conversation looking at the financial sector and in particular banks. Um, of course, there's been lots that's been reported around the lifting uh, of uh, the monitorium on the licensing and we've seen uh, State Bank of Mauritius uh, activity from there. We've seen the Dubai Islamic Bank and activity from there. What's the outlook uh, for the banking sector? The, the banking sector remains key of the or central in the entire financial sector. So your question is really on point. Mm. Uh, if you, you can tell the direction of the entire financial sector by looking at the direction of uh, the banking sector. So where are we with this? I think the first thing is we, we have to say that the, the problems of 2015, meaning the three institutions that we put in receivership and one later we put it under liquidation, uh, all those issues are receding back in, uh, you know, in the rear view mirror. Um, we are, of course, we've learned some lessons from that. Yeah. And those are the lessons we are taking forward. Mm. So we have uh, ushered in what we call the new normal. This is a phase where it's underpinned by three, um, let's say, 
um, three elements. Mm -hmm. The first one is uh, better uh, transparency, enhanced mm -hmm. transparency. So in terms of the numbers that come out, in terms of uh, um, even uh, structures of the banks and things like that, but greater transparency. This will allow you or your viewers or anyone else, mm. shareholders, well, not so, uh, depositors and others to understand what is going on in a particular institution. The other one is better governance, mm. enhanced governance. This was one of the problems that we saw in the three institutions that went under poor governance. Yeah. Um, and this one has to be understood that uh, um, a bank is a lot is completely different from some other corporate institution, meaning uh, a bank um, is holding depositor resources in trust. So there is a certain yeah. fiduciary responsibility, yeah. unlike say a supermarket, which you know only the shareholders really, and what is at stake there is the shareholders' capital. Yeah. So there's something. Different. So that's why governance is so important. Mm. And uh, the third element is uh, better business models. Mm. So we have asked them to look again at their business models. All banks look mm. at their business models and uh, with a view to be resilient. Mm. And if that means that, uh, I mean, looking ahead, um, they want to be in a particular niche and uh, in order to be not just sustainable, but in order to, be, to, to deal with the risks in that sector or in, the, in that niche, um, they would need to sort of consolidate with uh, or merge with another institution. Yeah. Well, they should do that. Mm. Or if they need some sort of ideas from other institutions, well, they can, uh, they can uh, sort of merge or um, get strategic investors from elsewhere. Yeah. So that's really what has happened. As a matter of fact, they, we asked our banks to give, to give us their um, revised uh, business plans mm -hmm. by the end of last month. And so now we are looking at all these things and trying to analyze and uh, mm. sign off on them and uh, give them our responses right. and things like that. But you can already see that there has been strengthening in the banking mm. sector. Mm. The, today, the completion of the acquisition by SBM of Fidelity mm. is, a real mi is an important milestone in this journey. Yeah. There has been other uh, elements like this in the past in the recent past. So this isn't the only mm. uh, sort of uh, signal or milestone. I mean, there has been, for instance, the uh, merger of uh, INM and uh, Gyro Bank. Mm -hmm. There has been uh, the purchase of uh, substantial share of uh, uh, by M Bank in, from Tanzania in uh, Orient Bank. Mm. There's mm. also discussions of uh, merger of uh, acquisition of uh, RB Bank by uh, DTB. Yeah. This is all happening, mm. and uh, and that is what is very visible. Right. There's a lot more that is going underneath mm. that, uh, in terms of strengthening and so forth. Finally, you have to be aware that uh, all banks are moving ahead uh, strongly. Um, in the path of innovation. Mm. It's, no one, it's, it's not, uh, well, I'll say, they are benefiting from this uh, element that mm. Kenya is really the hotbed of innovation. That's what uh, <laughs> you seem to call it, you know, <laughs> which is okay. A global fintech hub. Absolutely, but yeah. I think uh, it would be a disaster if everyone else is getting their fintech from Nairobi except our banks. Yeah. So I think this is, I mean, they see the challenge. And uh, I think this is why we are excited that mm. uh, um, actually the Kenyan financial sector, uh, led by the banking sector, can, uh, can mm. strengthen sharply, quickly. Our ambition is simple. Uh, we have a very clear ambition. Our vision is to be a global, world-class financial sector mm. or mm. hub, financial sector hub. And uh, when we talk that, we are, when we say that, we, yeah. are, we don't just mean, you know, locally. We yeah. mean globally. So we would want to In be... In the true sense. Yeah. So we would want to be in Dubai without the tower. That's <laughs> us. Final question, Governor. This is certainly uh, probably top of mind 
uh, for investors the upcoming elections. We had one of the questions in the earlier conversations about that. And no doubt uh, the political indicator is always going to be one that is going to be considered for any potential investment market. Um, what is the key message uh, that you could potentially share uh, with uh, investors tuning into the show and into this conversation right now? I think the couple of messages here. First is we are glad that we have, uh, um, we are going to have elections. Uh, this is uh, an important element of uh, being a democratic system. And uh, that whole process is important for us. It's important for the country to validate uh, its leaders in particular ways. So that is something we share and uh, we as a country, as a community, uh, support. Um, secondly, the message is that uh, regardless of uh, who gets elected, they all support and they've made it very clear that they are supportive of uh, market-based policies. Mm. So I think the, the question as to what would happen or what will happen uh, in the next administration, should we wait to see or should we adopt a wait and see attitude um, and then see what their policies are. Well, you can rest assured that they'll be market-based. Mm. And so I think there's less concern uh, of a change in direction um, there, on that, those sort of fundamental principles. Of course, there'll always be differences in terms of, uh, you know, on the, on the margins, in terms of maybe uh, what project or mm. what sector in society or what areas and all those things. But that is part of the political you know, calculus that needs to be, uh, to be, to, to take place. So we do not see much um, change in terms of uh, direction of economic policy. So I think your in investors should uh, take courage. Mm. Um, this is not a time to wait and see. Yeah. Again, as we say, the Africa capital markets are on the move and uh, Kenya is the heart of them. Mm. So I think in that sense, this is the time to invest in Kenya. I will finish with uh, uh, a description. Mm -hmm. um, I think Kenya is very much like a rose. It has, uh, it has a few thorns, but in the end, it grabs you. That's Kenya. <laughs> well, on that note, I don't think I could have finished this conversation in any better way. Uh, right from the heart of the rose uh, in East Africa, a few thorns, but it certainly grabs in. Of course, one of the key things that have come out of this conversation is that African capital markets are on the move and Kenya is leading the charge. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. I'm Nozi Pumbanjwa for CNBC Africa.